And good evening, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Bears All Access with a broadcast partner from News Radio 1059 WBBM. It's Tom Thayer, the Super Bowl guard. Good to talk to you once again. We're getting ready for the Heinz Field trip to take on the Steelers here in week nine. Bears with a three game slide at three and five. Steelers, a three game winning streak, and they are now four and three. They come out of the bye week and beat Cleveland, one of their divisional rivals. And head coach Mike Tomlin's got them back and rolling big time. Uh, uh, coming up on tonight's show, we'll be joined by Bill Hillgrove, the voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we're pleased to be joined by Jakeem Grant, the Bears return specialist and wide receiver. Tom, how are you framing this game? Oh, it's a big game. It's a national TV game. At Monday Night Football is something that we've been watching since we were kids. It's a great opportunity to get things back on track in a national scope. So I don't think you have to have any other approach to this game understanding what it means for the future of your football team in regards to this season, but how, you know, how positive it could be going forward. Tom, this is how Matt Nagy, the Bears head coach, who returned to work on Tuesday, cleared from protocol, so he is back and rolling, seems to be energized, but urgency, the key word for this team at the moment. There's definite urgency, and I think that that's, that's, that's okay. You need to have that. Um, we always talk about the, you know, the fork in the road and going left or going, going right. And we've been in other times throughout this, the, the years where we've had that decision to make and we've been pressed up against it and you got to go. And so we got, we have this game coming up and then you got to buy and then you got eight games left after that. Um, but the only thing that matters is making sure that we get that win. The, the wins change everything. It definitely deodorizes things that, that you don't do well, but it's okay to do that because you're winning. And, and so you look at the Steelers, for example, right? They started out one and three. Here they are four and three. They won three in a row. They fall through it. Um, they, they probably have pretty good leaders and probably have guys that, that care about playing. And they don't point fingers. They don't blame. They're not negative. They're positive. We got a positive room in there. Uh, the players are – they're positive. They care. And, again, like I said, um, let's – we want to we start a different – streak you know let's let's win one and then win another and continue to go and see where it leads but that's kind of the mindset that we have and there's without a doubt an urgency and that's okay and and so it's a similar tone as to other years when you're now talking about a season where you're trying to go one and all every week and that will be the theme the rest of the season yeah but you know jeff when you're in professional sports you never leave the sense of urgency that's one week to the next if you're on a five game winning streak you got a bigger sense of urgency because you got to keep on that winning streak when you're suffering through a losing streak, you have that sense of urgency to get it turned around and get onto that winning path. So the sense of urgency is a constant theme throughout your career. David Montgomery, a knee injury against Detroit, so it's a three-week window to get back on the field. Sounds like if he's ready to practice Thursday, he might have a chance to play this week. I hope he does, man. That dude, you know, he means a lot to this football team. And you talk about a positive energy inside the team meeting room. I think Dave Montgomery is one of the instigators of a positive feeling because he always has that sense of preparedness, of toughness, of give me another carry. And from what he's seen being delivered by Khalil Herbert, it's got to be exciting for David to get back on the field. Well, at the time of his injury, he was uh, top five in the league in terms of rushing the football and yards per carry. So that was very good. And obviously his leadership and his style of play is inspiring for those guys. And Herbert, uh, the best in the NFC uh, since he took over here the last four weeks in terms of rushing yards. Both of the, Everybody on this defense for the Pittsburgh Steelers know that these two guys are not easy to tackle. So that's what's going to be the point of emphasis delivered to the Steelers defense by their coaches. So, hey, I would love to see a 1-2, maybe a 1-2-3 punch when you add in Damian Williams because you talk about a fresh running game. That inspires an entire team. Deion Bush, Jermaine Effetti, uh, they still remain out. Seven Jenkins remains out. Khalil Mack, Tommy, will be day-to-day. Yeah, I just hope the best for Khalil Mack. But if the, he's not on the field, I want the other guys to play in his spot, inspired football, to be a part of the solution, defensively speaking, not part of you know the problem. So, I, I again, I want Khalil on the field, but if he's not there, the other guy's got to step up to the plate. Coming up next, we'll be joined by Jakeem Grant, the Bears' return specialist and wide receiver. An in-season trade from Miami, bringing some juice and energy to the Bears' offense and special teams unit. We'll have that coming up next here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. 
Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. With Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Pleased to be joined here on Bears All Access by return man and wide receiver Jakeem Grant. Jakeem, good to see you. Uh, you started out with a big smile on your face. I think that's your personality, man. You just light up a room. You light up the field. Your teammates dig you already. What's your story, man? What's what's with the big grin? <laughs> I'm I'm just happy, man. Just uh, happy to be here, and be in this uh, great organization, especially, man. Great teammates, great coaches. I, I mean, that's what, that's why you see the big grin on my face. Like I love it. It's well, just cold. <laughs> yeah, no, and there's nothing. There's nothing easy about getting moved in in the middle of a season, especially with a family. Uh, but that is the life of an NFL player, and that's the way it goes in all sports. But uh, to find the right chemistry, the right fit, to have guys that appreciate you, and vice versa. Otherwise you'd be miserable if it was anything other than that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, that's the biggest, I, I'll say that's the hardest part, just uh, being able to come here and, and adjust to not being away from family and friends and and just relocating and trying to figure out, you know, where am I going to stay, where am I going to do this? But, I mean, Bears work with me with open arms, so, man, it, it was it was just like a, a new family that, that, that loves me, and I love these guys because – they're great, especially everybody around the building. Hey, you came. You know, I kind of binge watched Friday Night Lights when it was a big topic about Texas football. How big was the role that Texas football played in not only your confidence, but also the real reality that you could be an NFL player? Uh, man, Texas football is big. Like we shut down cities, towns. I mean, just to go to a Friday Night Light game, and just knowing that. You know that that how big it is in Texas. Like every Texas kid are dreaming of going to the pros. Like if especially if you're playing football. And I know that was uh, that was one of my one of my dreams. I mean, I was just like, man, I, I have to make it to the next the next level and just continue to climb that mountain. And sure enough, I did. And so with everything you know going against me with my height and size, and so um, man, it, it was just it, it it was it's just the the relentless effort that I had and um, just thinking that I was going to make it to the lead, and I did. You know, so throughout my career, I was an offensive lineman. So I can go back and I can study tape of every other offensive lineman to see how they go about their business. When you think about the Chicago Bears or the league-wide, when you think about Gale Sayers and you think about Devin Hester and you think about recently Cordero Patterson, can a returner watch tape of another returner and learn or – is it all your innate ability that you have stored that that's, that's the way you go about your business? Um, I would say a little bit of both. Um, definitely coming from, you know, Cordero Palson and, you know, Devin Hester, um, just, just guys that I would say, you know, Devin Hester with, he did both, you know, punt return and kick return and just seeing the way like he hit the hole and see, um, how he, how explosive he was and there, there, no hesitation, just flat out just running and everything that he sees just hitting the hole, and especially, and I'll say going to Cordell Patterson, I mean, the guy's uh, as aggressive as you can, you, you can get. I mean, I, I kind of like mimic his game as far as bringing everything out. Cause as you can see, Cordell was bringing everything out. I mean, it doesn't matter. It could be uh, on the back, his heels on the back of the goal line. And he's, he's like, I'm I'm not letting any kicker get get off. Not not in one game. And so, um, well, with, with him, he was a f straight down line. He's a big guy, and and I mean, he hits the hole like like a bullet coming out of a barrel. But you know, that kind of leads me to the next question: Is how fortunate are you have to have a, a coach like Chris Tabor that gives you the freedom to do that? Because nowadays it's oh, put your hands up, and if it's one foot deep into the end zone, don't take it out, but no way. You got the freedom to bring it out wherever you are. Man, that's exactly what I been dreaming for, a coach like Coach Tate. Man, it, and whenever he told me, hey, Jakeem, you have the green light, I was just, I felt like, you know, Steph Curry would go to state. Like, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I'm bringing everything out that I can. And he trusts that I'm going to get a great return. And so, with, with and especially the guys on the unit are, are trusting me to, you know, get a great return as well. And I'm trusting those guys to get their block. So there's no indecisiveness of, of not bringing it out. So I'm like, hey, anytime he kicks it back here, it's, it's, it's coming out. Unless it's, it's out of the 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jakeem Grant, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score uh, with you until uh, the top of the hour. Uh, listen, we're, we're used to it here, so that excitement. So I, you know, Cordero's a freight train coming out, right? Just, you know, yes. get north and south. And then you got the ballet of Devin Hester, who, by the way, celebrating a birthday today, as luck would mm-hmm. have it. So happy wow. birthday to the ridiculous <laughs> one. Uh, have yeah. you ever had a chance meeting with Devin Hester to discuss uh, his style and what he saw? Because he always, I did many interviews with him. I called almost every one of his return touchdowns. He said to me all the time, I said, what, what makes you realize when to make that cut? He says, whenever I see color in the hole, I go the other way. He kept it that simple. Other jersey, boom, go the other way. It's not that simple as we know. There's there's other instincts involved and when to hit the gas and when to okie doke somebody to get the edge. Uh, but have you ever had a chance to talk with Devin? Um, I didn't. I actually got a chance to play against him. Uh, I think it was a year he was in. Was it Baltimore? Atlanta. Atlanta? Uh, it was it. Yeah, Baltimore. Um, I was back there every pregame with returning kicks, and I'm like, that's Devin Hester. I was starstruck. So, I mean, I, I kind of didn't I kind of didn't go up to him or anything. I was just like, I was like, yo, Devin, big fan. That's it. And then I, I didn't even chat with him because I was – I didn't know what to say at the time because, like, I'm a rookie, and I'm like, man, like, this is a guy that I looked up to for a long time, and it's just like I couldn't get my words out. Like, I'm just like – Hey, I just introduced myself. I didn't want it. Like, I was just like, it's, it's, it's whatever. I'm going to let him do his game. I'm, I'm going to watch him throughout the course of the game and try to, you know, study him live. Well, the thing about Devin, uh, and I do agree that he's Hall of Fame caliber, should be in there. I, I sent a tweet out today. You know, that's the next step in his journey, the Hall of Fame, because he revolutionized how teams prepared for special teams. Mm-hmm. Because before the rule changes, you had to beef up your special teams coverage. You had to do it. And you had to yep. determine at key points in the game situationally, are we kicking to him? Are we not? And everybody got up off the bench to watch him. And I kind of feel the same way when Cordero was here and when you're here now. There's an excitement expectation with you. And we appreciate the return. We're old school guys. We don't want yeah. to see change. Don't, don't legislate it out of the game. I know we got to keep people safe. No question about it. But it's still the excitement. It's the grand slam in the ninth inning with the bases juice. You know, it's, it's the big one. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as, as a football player, do you appreciate still that kind of thinking? Like, yeah, it's still a major part of our game. Absolutely. It's a, it's definitely a a tone setter and a a change of momentum. Like you, um, I mean, it can flip the course of the game just like that. And I feel like at any given moment that, you know, I get a return that it could, swing the momentum or we could just continue to take the, you know, take the air out of the stadium. You All know, right. so you got five of them here. You had four in college. How many did you have in high school? Kick or um, punt return touchdowns. I never did punt return ever in my life until I got to the national football league. Oh, that's a missed opportunity over there in Mesquite, so, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, at Mesquite Horn, um, I'm not sure how many I had. I, I think I, I had a, I had a, I had a good decent amount. So, um, but Man, like I said, I never did punt return ever in my life until I got to the National Football League. I'm not gonna lie, I was scared. I was scared. I was absolutely scared. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you because I, I can. Let's say a, a quick story. Uh, my rookie season, uh, I was there with Dan Rizzi, which awesome coach. Um, I get there and they're like, "Jakeem, you're gonna be the punt returner." In my head, I'm like, "Man, this is not gonna go well." Like I've never caught a punt. I don't know how to judge him. I don't know what you want me to do back there. So. Um, we get to the preseason game against the Giants and we double vice the guys and I just let the ball bounce and go out of bounds. Rizzy is like red, hot, red, hot. And this is like, gave me a mouthful when I got to the sideline. I looked there, I looked at Coach Riz. I said, Coach, I was scared. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I don't know what you want me to do. And then he was like, listen, just, just calm down. That The team is going to block for you. Catch the ball. I caught the next one, went 40, and then I was just like, you know, you know what? Maybe I do got a knack for this. Well, what do you what do you think about inside Soldier Field? Is it a difficult judgment of the flight of the football, both on kickoffs and punts, because of you know the conditions that can happen there, the wind that can happen, and even that the fact that it's an outdoor stadium with a natural surface? Um, yeah, it's a, it is quite, it is quite a difference because of the wind and how much, how long it could hang up or it could drop at any given moment, especially, you know, with the wind 
going either way, east or west. Um, I think it's you get that, you know, get get that practice doing, you know, during practice time. So um, I think Patio does a great, great job with me coming out here early and kicking some to me, when, especially when it's a windy day at practice and just, you know, getting – getting those reps in so I can know come game time how the wind is going to play and how it's going to hang up or if it's going to dive down. And so, um, yes, yeah, it is different from from what I've experienced. So when you practiced here at training camp, Jeff and I were out there every practice and, you know, your name was already on the radar. Did you know that week that the Bears had interest in you? Was it kind of a different type of a training camp practice week because of that? And what were – you know, what do you remember from that week of practice? Um, I did get a, a tip off from my agent that that the Bears were interested in me. And it was the same. I, I approached the training camp the same way. But I told my agent, I said, hey, man, what are we waiting for? Like, go ahead and pull the trigger. Like, let's let's do this. Like, let's let's get it rolling so I can get caught up to speed, learn the playbook and, you know, get get rolling. And. So enough, they didn't pull the trigger quick enough, and and I wouldn't be having to, you know, jumble around, find an apartment, and doing all this, and find the house and stuff like that. But man, it's uh, better late than never. Uh, and right. I love it here. Took the okay. words right out of my mouth. The dream is here. That's his Twitter handle, folks. The dream is here. <laughs> Jakeem, the dream. We'll continue yes, our conversation sir. with the Bears wide receiver and kick returner after this break on Chicago Sports Radio six seventy. The score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak with you. Our guest this week, Jakeem Grant, kind enough to join us. So you got quite the history now. We're going to get into a bunch of different things here because at Texas Tech, you broke records. Uh, you were in uh, an offense with Cliff Kingsbury before that, Tommy Tuberville. Uh, you, you had Patrick Mahomes throwing yeah. your passes. Baker yeah. Mayfield was there. Was Davis Webb there as well when you were at Texas Tech? Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, and, and you broke Michael Crabtree's school record for career yardage. There's a lot to unpack right there. What was that experience like in an air raid offense? It put you on the map. And, and I'll tell you, I know you're probably going to disagree with this, but coming out of Texas Tech, I had you at 5'5 five, five, and 7'8. Are, are, are we on target? <laughs> 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 nah, man, definitely not. I always tell people I, I I'm I'm five six without my shoes off, okay. and I'm five seven with my shoes on. So therefore, like I tell everybody, I'm five seven, but I play like I'm six, you know, foot whatever, a giant. So um, yeah, man, like nah, <laughs> I feel like I'm a tall guy. Yeah, well, I'm five seven and a half, and I hang on for that half every chance I get. Yeah. So, and no question about it. Uh, but what about all that experience you had over there? How did it make you? Because we keep talking about you as a return guy, but but you know you're getting your your beak wet a little bit on offense here too. Um, man, offense. Uh, I always want to show people that I'm a receiver first slash, uh, you know, return man because I want to show people with me and my height. I knew that I already had the odds going against me. So I want to add a little something extra to my game, which was the return. And so, um, man, Coach Kingsbury, he's seen that, that I could be a great receiver. And so, um, I mean, he utilized me in ways that, you know, to give me mismatch on, you know, linebackers, um, their worst corners and stuff like that. And also I had, you know, Patty, Patty Holmes throwing me the ball. So it was also a great thing. Um, but yeah, man, when I stepped in the building, I see all the Hall of Fame, Texas Tech Hall of Famers on the wall inside the facility. And I looked to um, Eric Morris was my, you know, my receivers coach. And I told him, um, I told him, I'm going to be on that wall one day. Like, that's, that's for sure. I'm, I'm going to be on the wall one day. And I asked him one day, I was like, hey, who has the school record for receiving yards? And he was like, Crabtree. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to break his record this year. Like. I'm there's no doubt in my mind I'm break it. And so um, that was always my mentality to leave a mark and leave a legacy. And so no matter my height or size, I want to be the best guy on the field at any given moment. Anytime I stepped on the field, I want to be the best guy. And I want to show people that like when you stand up and say, man, that Jakeem is by far the best guy on the field at all times. And so that's my whole mentality and that's how I approach the game. And so with, you know, Coach Kingsbury, you know, pushing me to, you know, to be the best that I can be and 
asking me, you know, hey, Jakeem, I'm, I'm going to ask a lot of you. So you have to give me you have to give me more and more and more. And so um, and I was a leader of that team. So I had to show show the young bucks, you know, the ropes. And and I felt like I, I did. I did a great job. Well, well, Jakeem, so your junior year, you have 67 catches. Your senior year, you have 90 catches. So was it, were you featured more in the offense? Was it just a, a lack of respect from the other defenders that you were facing? Why, Why? because you had an increase in number every year, but it should have said, but by, by the time you're a junior, they know that what your your assets are to that team. And so what was the reason for the big jump? I would say the reason for the big jump, not because of, um, I would say they the respect or anything like that. I would say my junior year, I had you know I had guys like there. It wasn't just me that was doing all the work. It was you know I had Jason Morrow, um, I had who else? I had I had Eric Ward. I had all those guys there that was you know putting up numbers as well. And you know he was spreading the ball around, spreading the ball around. And so um, my senior year, let's be honest, I was the only guy. <laughs> I was the only guy. So Pat, it was like hey. Jakeem, I'm coming to you. Uh, Coach King was like, we, we need you. Got to get it done. Like, we're coming to you third down. I mean, we don't like double coverage. No matter what, we're coming to you. And so it, I was that guy. Like, I was I was the number one. And I felt like, you know, I had to approach the game that way. And I didn't have anybody helping me. So I was just, it was, it was game on. <laughs> Well, how how is uh you know you talk about Chris Tabor and what, what a what a role that he plays in your returning, but then you look at Mike Fury, your receivers cro- coach. The dude's intense, man. He's yeah. if he's not running stadium stairs before the game, he's out there <clears throat> leading the cheers at practice. How is he in terms of helping you continue to develop your skills as a receiver? Um. I would say he he critiques me on uh, every little thing you know that I do. It, it doesn't matter, um, you know. He tells me if I did a good route or, hey, Jakeem, you you rounded the route or you got to come out of that that route smoking. Um, you know, uh, I felt like he's definitely getting me caught up to speed with the offense and telling me uh, in ways that they they could utilize me. Hey, Jakeem, we're going to put you on the slot. We're going to get you a mismatch on linebackers, this and, uh, this and that. And, I mean, I, I I love his energy. Like, his energy yeah. is, is through the roof. And he's like, hey, JG, uh, <laughs> got to get you rolling. Got to get you flying. Like, and and I love that out of him because um, – it's a guy, it's a guy ultimately you want to play for, especially with the energy and just the fact that he wants you to be great and, and be at your all-time high. And I, I love that of him. Jakeem Grant, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This is Bears All Access with Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak. So what's the legit 40 time? Because we can talk about this all day long too. So uh, uh, New Orleans scout allegedly at your T-Tech Pro Day, 4-1. Potentially beating Bo Jackson's 1986 combine 412 uh, and then the electronically 434. I had you at 437. Is the truth somewhere in between all this? Um, I wouldn't say in between. I'll say it's exactly what uh, <laughs> allegedly was put out. Um, the 41? Yeah, I definitely, yeah, I can, like, that was uh, what, five years ago? Yeah. Um, I can, and, me running a four, I can run a four three now. Like I can get up and just run a four three. So, uh, definitely with me, I, I weigh more and I, I that you're four lightning. One. In other words, you're lightning. <laughs> I, I can run. A, yeah, I can run. I can that four three is 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 impressive, but I can do that. I can do that in my sleep. Yeah, so. and when you got a quarterback like Justin Fields who runs a four four, that's a heck of a. Heck of a exactly. pair right there, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's rare indeed. All right, so um, the one interesting thing that I've learned, and I don't know if I have the facts right, but so you're a father of three. You got you got twin daughters, right? You got twin daughters. Yes, sir. Uh, you got Jakeem Jr., you got Kaylee and Kylie. Uh, but did you have all three while you were in college? Absolutely. On, now, how did you pull this off being a dad, twin daughters, Scholarship athlete at Texas Tech, get ready for the NFL. How'd you do this? I will tell you that was probably one of the hardest things of, of my life. Um, I not only I had all three of them with, and I was like, my scholarship checks are not going to cover. So I was going to school, I was going to practice, and I had a job as well. 
And also with, you know, um, you know, my, my sister-in-law helped out and while I was at work because my wife, she reactivated her childhood seizures. And so she was hospitalized for, for a couple of weeks and with all this going on. So whenever I got off work, I was taking, I was full-time dad and, you know, there was no sleep, zero, none. And I'm talking about, it was work, it was school, practice, work, you know, kids, you know, doing all these things all at once. Like I'm telling you when I had no sleep and then it was sounds where coach was like, um, we had 5 a.m. punishments. And I was like, Coach King, come on, man. I, there's no way. Like I'm already not getting any sleep. And he was like, you're part of the team. So wow. you got to get up at 5 a.m. And, you know, I didn't. And then it was times where like coach was like, if Jakeem can get up, then anybody can get up with everything that's going on. So I feel like that ultimately made me a better player, uh, a better person, just just showing that at, when adversity hits, you just got to continue to push through. And so, and I feel like I did that because that was the hardest time of my life is where caring for my, my kids and keeping my grades up and also being, you know, a top, you know, a top guy on this team, a leader and, and not showing guys that, you know, even though I have things going on that my skill play or anything is going to drop off. Wow, that's an impressive, impressive thing, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we can ever claim that we had that. No, no. Kind of shoulders the load. You. I thought I, I was busy. I admire <laughs> you in the NFL, and I admire you even more now. Unbelievable. Well, a yeah. great thing to teach them when they're older too. And I've seen pictures of you. You look like one of the kids. You got the big oh, grin. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm serious. You guys all look <laughs> They're adorable. Oh, oh my gosh. You. you were an inline speed skater, correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Your mom made you do this. Is it made you a better football player because of that? Actually, yeah. Uh, I would say I started out doing speed skating be, uh, at Broadway Skating Room in Mesquite. Um, we, I didn't, I wasn't playing football at the time. Did not want to play football. I wasn't thinking about it. And, I was just an uh, inline speed skater, just killing guys, like absolutely <laughs> killing them. And we used to play this g game called, you know, Sharks in the Meadows, where it's four guys on skates and, you know, a whole bunch of guys and uh, little kids in the middle of the ring. I was the last one to get out. I was the last one to get out. And my mom was in and she came in and she was watching and I made all four of the guys on skates fall. And I ended up winning the, uh, my own skates from the skating ring and that next day, my mom signed me up for football, and I'm like, what are you doing? I'm a skater. Like, I don't want to play football. And she was like, don't worry. It'll pay off, and you'll thank me later. Certainly happened. Sylvia Whitaker knew what she was doing. Just like Tommy, his mom dropped him off at football practice. He cried for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd say, you'll stop crying when you see your friends. Yep. <laughs> All right, I'll leave you with this. Uh, what was your favorite nickname given to you? What would they call you? I mean, everybody called me. Can't, my, my favorite nickname is like even every coach, every coach in the world, like my coach is still to this day in high school. So call me. So like I'm dark. I'm I feel like I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm a darkest night. And so all my coaches call me black, even like every coach call me black. Like I had teachers like they didn't call me Jakeem in high school. They called me black like every and I love it. I absolutely love it. You I did. I was like, no, coach, I said, coach, do you see how dark I am? Like you turn the lights off. Only thing you can see is my teeth and my eyes. Oh, like that's, <laughs> that's me. I'm dark. And I, and I embrace it. And my coach Sherman, coach Webb, coach Morris, nobody calls like, they still don't call me Jakeem to this day. And I'm saying, Hey coach, he's like, black, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. And, and people on the outside looking like, did he just call him black? I'm like, yeah, that's his nickname. And like, it's crazy because one of my teachers is named, uh, her name is Miss White. And so I call her Miss White. And then she called me black. And then they, they everybody like on the outside <laughs> looking in like, what's going on here? Like what's going on? And I'm like, that's, that's my favorite nickname of like, Oh, like it's like everybody still call me that back home still to this day. Coaches, teachers, uh, principal, Mr. Wow. Perkins, still at John Horn High School, <laughs> still, still call me black to this day. You roll yes. with it, right? Exactly. Hey, Jakeem, we're out of time. We appreciate all your time. This was fascinating, and there's even a Absolutely. lot more about you we want to get into down the road. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Jakeem, Jakeem. Jakeem Grant, our guest here on Bears All Access. Tommy and I will visit with the voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Bill Hillgrove. That's coming up next here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. 
One of the prominent personalities in the rich sportscape of Pittsburgh is Bill Hillgrove, the voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers. This segment of Bears All Access is sponsored by CDW. People who get it, learn more at CDW.com. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer with you as we get you an inside look at the 4-3 and three Steelers. Bill, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I got to go back in your history a little bit because... Uh, it's, it's a great tradition of excellence in your career. You graduated from Duquesne the year I was born in 1962, and then handpicked by the Steelers owner Dan Rooney in 1994 and succeeded uh, the retiring Jack Fleming. So you got a lot of NFL history to you. I always say our jobs is play-by-play, guys, and, and the big picture is to chart the history of the game, and you've done that really well over the course of your career. Does it still feel fun? Oh, it is, without question, and more fun when they win. And so uh, for the last three weeks, I've had more fun than I did the previous three. But, you know, the reality of this year is that this team hasn't lost in a month. And, you know, they finally started to get things together. Now, okay, the opening game at Buffalo, that kind of shocked the world when they went up there and won. Uh, But then some reality set in. And the reality was simply this. Uh, The offensive line, a work in progress. Not G. Harris, a rookie. You can't expect him to carry the team, although... He's looking more and more like he's capable of doing that. And uh, I thought that the receivers weren't helping Ben as much as he needed. And in the meantime, you know, after that first game where T.J. Watt had a great performance against Josh Allen, uh, you know, he he had uh, some injury problems that kind of put him uh, in the background. And and as a result, the defense wasn't as as good as I thought it would be. So uh, all those things have started to come together. They just have to keep the nose to the grindstone. Bill, you talk about all the foundations of success throughout history for the Pittsburgh Steelers. One thing I'm always kind of attracts my attention to the Steelers is the longevity of the head coaches you have in this organization. When you look at the personality now of the head coach and the personalities of the past, why is that such a point of emphasis or success for the Pittsburgh Steelers? I think it's the Rooney way. Uh, Dan Rooney once told Merle Hodge, uh, look uh, at what we've done with Chuck Knoll, Bill Cower, and Mike Tomlin. We took guys who had no previous head coaching experience but were excellent coaches, and we gave them time to learn how to be head coaches in this league. And I think that's their secret to success. The Roonies are patient. Uh, They don't do anything hair trigger. And as a result, you know, you've got that standard is the standard, all those coaching terms that you hear. Uh, But it's the truth. It's it's just like, um, you know, it's incredible. I mean, these are three coaches uh, who are all Hall of Fame. And I have no doubt that Tomlin will be there. When you look at the offense right now, you think of the redevelopment of the offensive line, bringing in a rookie running back, or recommitting, in a sense, to uh, Roethlisberger. What is the biggest building block of the success of that segment of your football team to get you to the point where you're at right now? Well, let's just look at last year's line. And I know they missed Marquise Pouncey. They missed David DeCastro. Uh, But uh, let's face it, uh, they played hurt last year. And, and so I said during the offseason, no matter who replaces them, it's going to take time, like it always does for lines to mesh. Uh, but they're going to be better off in the long run than playing with injured people. And so, you know, I've, I've seen great progress from Kendrick Green. Uh, I've seen uh, Trey Turner kind of lead this group because he's got the experience. And, uh, you know, their tackles have done okay. I think Dan Moore Jr. is a bit undersized for that left side. And I know he had a tough afternoon against uh, Miles Garrett, but uh, the biggest play of the game uh, was the fourth and two where Ben uh, was about to get clubbed by Miles. And all of a sudden, Najee came in and did his little chip, and it just kept Miles away from Ben so he could complete that pass to Friar move. And that's another element that really a lot of people didn't see as happening as quickly as it has, and that's Pat Friar move is starting to show people that, uh, you know, uh, he can be uh, one of the fine tight ends. And, and I think they're targeting him more now, and he's catching just about everything. And so I think it's all kind of just starting to fit together. Bill Hillgrove, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score, this is Bears All Access. With Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Yeah, you know, I loved your call on the Friarmouth catch in the end zone, a 50-50. You called it a combat catch. Is that is that your <laughs> typical phrase for uh, balls like that and 50-50 catches? 
Yes. And, and, <laughs> the guy who, and the guy who's more physical is going to win the fight. Uh, and I see it a lot with Chase Claypool as well. Uh, Chase has got that big body. And uh, if a DB uh, or a linebacker goes up with them, uh, they have to be prepared for a battle. And I think, uh, believe me, uh, quarterbacks will be the first to tell you that they trust their guys to win those battles. And so far this year, the combat catches seem to be going Pittsburgh's way. Uh, Najee Harris, when the draft started, the process started, I thought, you know, circle this guy. He's a total Pittsburgh Steeler running back. And that has been the case. An impact player at 230 does everything well. The 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 receiving aspect of his game, you know, going back to that, was it the Cincinnati game? He was targeted 19 times for 14 catches. It's helping Ben in his quick game. And, you know, if the rush is coming, Ben doesn't need to get whacked. So get rid of the ball quick. And, and just overall, he just was named October Rookie of the Month in the AFC. Yeah, and that's very well deserved. Uh, you know, he just he's the whole package. He can make guys miss. Uh, he's physical. Uh, he had a run against the Browns right to left, so I can't remember which quarter it was, uh, but was in front of the Steelers bench. And he threw two lethal stiff arms, uh, and he can do that. And he's got just enough quickness and speed to really function as an NFL back. And like I say, with his willingness to block and ability to block and he's and catch, he's the whole package. Hey, Bill, if T.J. Watt wasn't being as productive as he is right now, would there be any lingering personal hangover from him sitting out of the practices of training camp and just dangle, dangling that new contract request in front of the players, the team, and the organization? You know, I, I think that kind of thing after September comes and goes is a non-issue. Uh, and I think the Steelers felt that. Uh, they didn't have the best September, but a darn good October, and they just hope it continues in November. So I, I think it became a non-issue with the passage of time. And so the, when you talk about the defensive side of the ball, I mean, it's it's kind of when you sit here and watch these guys, there's so much pre-snap movement by a defense you know is this a new style of defense that you've had to come to learn from your beginnings with the Pittsburgh Steelers to where they're at in this new generation I, I don't think it's new I just think it's adaptive um, Keith Butler uh, you know having been a player for uh, more than a decade in the league and certainly all the coaching he's done uh, learned from the master Dick LeBeau and, but since Dick has retired, the game is changing. And, and I think Keith is wise enough to know that he's got to adapt some of the great things he learned from, uh, from uh, his predecessor uh, to uh, you know, accommodate today's game, which is changing. Uh, mobile quarterbacks is the one thing that uh, Dick LeBeau didn't have to do, uh, deal with as much as Keith Butler does. And, and I think you know, that's just an element of the game that is real now and and you have to you have to deal with it and i think they're doing as best they can to do that um, I, I just like uh, his approach and i just like the fact that uh, tj watt uh, has to be accounted for and if you double team him and if you double team cam hayward two other guys are wide open to do some damage and i think that's the threat that the steelers defense can present an offense and i think you know for the bears who have dealt with sack issues this year uh, you know, that's something they, they probably are mindful of and spending a lot of uh, late hours uh, trying to combat. Our final moments with Bill Hillgrove, the veteran voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Sunday will be, excuse me, Monday will be in Pittsburgh with our 420 pregame and a 720 kickoff on News Radio 1059 WBBM. Got to get one more in here for you uh, because he's a local kid from Fenwick High School here in Chicagoland. Robert Spillane, a third year player out of Western Michigan, a linebacker. Uh, Tommy, I don't know if you know, but he's the grandson of Johnny Latner, the 1953 Notre Dame Heisman winner. So uh, give us a little thumbnail on what he brings to the table. We give a shout-out to the locals all the time. He brings uh, that motor that you love. Uh, he brings a physicality that you love. Um, he's still developing as a coverage guy, and they know that. Uh, but, you know, with a guy like Schobert next to him, uh, you know, he's he, he's got the ability to pick up everything that Schobert can uh, send his way in terms of, you know, how do you how do you cover and how do you prepare uh, yourself to, uh, you know, to be in that position? So, you know, this guy's got an upside. And, and I go back to Johnny Latner. I remember <laughs> when this, this drafted him in 1953. Right. And let's face it, 
let's face it. Uh, you were born the year I graduated from college. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's when the Dead Sea wasn't even sick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and you got a birthday coming up this month. Unbelievable. Did you think you were going to be able to keep doing this into your 80s? I thought that I'd try. And like wow. I said, as long as it's fun and as long as the guy upstairs uh, goes along with the program, sure. Why not? I mean, who has more fun than we do? We're like golf pros. What do we retire to? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you're the pride of Central Catholic there in Pittsburgh, also the home of Dan Marino, Tom's old teammate with the Miami Dolphins. Great guy and a yeah. great quarterback. And I'm prejudiced. He's the best I ever saw, the best that God ever put on the planet. And uh, I saw him last week. He was in town. Uh, Pitt had their Hall of Fame uh, dinner the night before the Clemson game. And I said to myself, you know, this school is kind of unique. I'm talking about the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, there were four NFL Hall of Famers in attendance. Not a lot of schools can come up with that in one night. And uh, that was just an incredible uh, experience. Hey, Bill, my senior year at Notre Dame, we went to Pitt and played Pitt when they were number one in the country. A team led by Jerry Faust, and we had no business beating them. And we went up to that hilltop, and we beat Pitt, one of the Best games, uh, the most fun victories in my college career by far. Was that Alan Pinkett? Yes, yes, sir. I can still see Yogi Jones diving and whiffing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of this game. I love it. I love the history. I love the stories. Bill, we could talk to you for quite some time uh, picking your brain about your uh, long success in broadcasting football, not only for the Steelers, but the Pitt Panthers and Pitt basketball. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you Monday night. Thank you, guys. A pure pleasure. See you then. All right, Bill Hillgrove, our guest, coming up next to the Bears angle of this matchup with the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's coming up next here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Download the Chicago Bears app to play our new predictor game, Risk It, brought to you by Bet Rivers for your chance to win $250 in free bets in a custom Bears jersey. With Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak, our final moments on tonight's show. First thing you think of of the black and gold is toughness are they a tough team here in 2021 or is it a different team is there a finesse to them as well no i think they're a tough team because you still had the senior statesmen like ben roethlisberger on that team and a couple of the members on the defensive side of the ball so they bring that tradition along with them but you're also trying to introduce that tradition to some young guys like Najee harris the running back and if you can get these guys to come aboard then you know i think it's Smooth, not smooth sailing, but, you know, sailing along for the Pittsburgh Steelers like traditionally we know them to be. So I think um, it's an inspired franchise led by their head coach that trickles to some of the veteran players that spills out to the younger guys. All right, so as we break things down a little bit here, the Bears obviously have done a great job running the football. They want to run the football. This is a quote from Mike Tomlin talking about what was the Browns NFL best running offense last week. They held Nick Chubb to 16 for 61. Quote, there is no secret sauce. You have to come off blocks. You have to hit, wrap, and make tackles. You have to get multiple people to the football. That's it. And, and Akeem Hicks said it last week. The Bears have to do that now against the Steelers. How do you feel the Steelers? How do you feel the Steelers chalk up against the Bears' rushing offense. I'm really interested to listen to you call the game on Monday night because they have so much pre-snap defensive movement before the snap of the ball that you really have to pay attention to it if you're an offensive lineman or you're a blocker in any position. Sometimes you're not going to have a chance to vocally make the changes up front in terms of the blocking schemes. You're going to have to just trust the guy next to you. And, you know, back in the generation of our time playing, there's a lot of teams that move right before the snap of the ball. This Pittsburgh Steeler does it with great efficiency. So if everybody's not on the same page, it's going to be difficult. But if they are on the same page, you're going to see some big second and third level runs by the Bears running backs. All right, now to Sean Gibson has familiarity with Big Ben. He played him several times as a Cleveland Brown. You know, he don't want to get hit. He took a lot of hits in his in his days, man. He's not the same old Ben Roethlisberger that's shading guys off like he used to. You know, that used to be crazy, man. I used to be in Cleveland seeing that three guys had to take the guy down. So, obviously, he don't want to get hit anymore. And, and it shows. And, obviously, their, play, their, 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 their plays are designed for him to get the ball out quick. So, uh, with that... Uh, those D-line know that, hey, man, if they can't get to the quarterback, get the hands up because, obviously, tips and overthrows, this is saying you got to get those, get the hands up, man. They tip some balls, man. That's obviously an opportunity for us on the back end. But, you know, he taking shots when needed, not many vertical passes that he's willing to take, but uh, he's that quarterback that's going to take what you give him. And that's always dangerous because any time you're dealing with a quarterback, not many quarterbacks will want to take five-yard checkdowns 
all the way down the field. It's, it's a few select quarterbacks, and most of those guys are Hall of Fame. The Drew Brees, the Tom Brady, the Aaron Rodgers, you give them five, they'll take five. Um, and he fall in that category. So, obviously, you got to play tighter. Uh, this is going to be a game plan where we're going to have to play with our eyes, vision break, man, be a little tighter in coverage, and, uh, you know, give those guys time to hunt in the front end. But those guys know that the ball come out quick enough, man, that if you can't get there, get, the, get, get, get your hands up because, obviously, those are opportunities for the back seven to be able to affect the game that way. And, Tommy, they just got to make sure they don't give up the big play. The big play, obviously, was a haunting experience against the 49ers, and it's happened a time or two this season. So limit uh, and try to get them in the third and long. They like being in third and short where they can do what he just said. Yeah, but, you know, Roethlisberger's been doing a nice job this year of not only helping develop the tight end position, but then using the other assets he has at his disposal. You talked about a game where Najee Harris – was targeted, what did you 19 say, 19 times? 19 times, yeah, he caught 14 which is, passes. Which is unheard of, but then you got Chase Claypool, the second-year receiver out of Notre Dame. What's he carry, a 6'5 frame with leaping ability. And so 11 touchdowns last year, yeah. Right, big weapons downfield, speedy weapons in Johnson, and uh, the emerging Najee Harris. And if you had to name three keys for the Bears to get a victory, where are you starting? You know, time of possession on offense, keep Big Ben off the field. If you can have a productive running game against the Pittsburgh Steelers at home, that's the biggest weapon of disaster that they don't want to face. And I think the Bears have it with, you know, whether David Montgomery plays or not. you got to keep Justin Fields' versatility outside the pocket. Make sure those defensive ends on that, on that side of the ball can't rush to one singular point in the backfield. Defense, we've been searching for turnovers. Some way, shape, or form, that gifty AFC division has got to gift the Bears another interception, fumble recovery, and I'll even go out there and put a special teams yeah. return of, of some note. All right, we'll talk to you on the radio on Monday night, 420 pregame, 715 kickoff on News Radio 1059 WBBM. Thanks to our producers, Jordan Treadup and Dan Barilli. For our guests, Bill Hillgrove, Jakeem Grant, I'm Jeff Joniak with Tom Thayer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, everybody at The Score, and thank you for listening tonight. Good night. This is Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score.